Welcome to this e-lecture on supplier selection. My name is Finn Winstra, professor in purchasing and supply management at Rotterdam School of Management at Erasmus University and holder of the chair endowed by the Dutch Association for Purchasing Management, Navy. This e-lecture was originally developed for the course Purchasing and Supply Management, a core course in the Supply Chain Management Master's program at RSM. During the presentation I will refer to a number of sources. You will find the full references of these sources at the end of the presentation. This e-lecture deals with supplier selection, one of the main processes within purchasing and supply management. In the PSM wheel, which we often use as a reference framework in structuring our teaching, supplier selection in combination with the tendering process is the fourth process within the upper half of the wheel, the sourcing part. Tendering can be defined as the process by which a buying organization puts up its needs for bidding by different suppliers. Tendering and supplier selection follows sourcing strategy development, which results in category-specific sourcing strategies, such as, for instance, advocated by the Kralich portfolio. Only after a category strategy has been defined is it possible to effectively and efficiently execute a tendering and supplier selection process. After one or several suppliers have been selected, the next sourcing process is contracting. I have been referring to supplier selection, but what is it exactly? Bijl defines it as the process by which the buying firm identifies, evaluates and contracts with suppliers. Note that this is a slightly broader definition than in the PSM wheel of the previous slide, where contracting is a separate process. If you interpret Bijl's contracting to mean picking the winner or winners, there is still room for a separate contracting process. Identifying, in Bijl's definition, refers to listing potentially relevant or illegible suppliers. Evaluating, in this definition, refers to scoring the qualities of suppliers and or their offerings. It will be clear that supplier selection is an important process within purchasing and supply management. And in this quote from the work of Krauss and colleagues, supplier selection, and by the way, retention, is primarily framed as the manifestation, the expression of the purchasing function's competitive priorities. I would add, in relation to what I said on the previous slide, that such priorities are not only defined at the level of the PSM function as a whole, but also, and most importantly, at the level of each sourcing category. Why new suppliers? While many studies have emphasized the value and the actual existence of long-term buyer-supplier relationships, every now and then a buying organization may need new suppliers and hence need to enter into a supplier selection process. This may be because the buying firm has started to offer new products and services to its customers and has decided to not fully produce those offerings in-house. Or supply markets or technological conditions change. Any of the listed conditions, and perhaps some more, may lead to the need for new suppliers, or at least the need to reconsider the selection of suppliers with whom the buying organization is doing business. When starting a supplier selection process, various choices need to be made. In some of these choices, the purchasing department may be in the lead, but as we argue for most of the processes, purchasing and supply management is essentially a cross-functional business process. One could argue that there are two main areas in which choices need to be made, which criteria to apply and which tendering and selection procedures to follow. 
as described in the bottom half of the slide. Weil refers to studies that have identified price, quality and delivery as the most prevalent criteria in supplier selection, but other criteria apply as well, innovativeness, sustainability. Another important choice is obviously the relative importance of the different criteria. Regarding the procedures to follow, buying firms have a choice of different tendering processes to follow and selection methods to use. Organizations that fall under public procurement legislation, however, have less freedom which procedures to follow. Later on in this e-lecture, I will say a few words about different tendering processes in general. The choices regarding criteria and procedures should be guided by two groups of inputs reflected in the upper half of the slide the purchasing situation in terms of demand and supply, and the purchasing objectives. The objectives are obviously closely related to the criteria to be used, but partly also go beyond that. The objectives could also pertain to the number of supplies to be selected and their geographical spread, for instance. As discussed earlier, these objectives are typically defined in the category sourcing strategy, which helps to effectively and efficiently conduct the tendering and selection process. However, not all organizations may have explicit category sourcing strategies or not for all of their buying needs. And the objectives may then need to be identified during the tendering process. Defining the purchasing situation basically refers to the analysis of business demand and supply market, the second process in the sourcing part of the PSM wheel from slide two. What are the qualitative and quantitative needs of the buying firm? What is the current and future capacity of the supply market, etc.? Many studies argue that it is helpful to define the buying situation for which the supplier selection process needs to take place. And the marketing and organizational buying behavior literature that emerged in the 1960s referred to three main situations. New task, modified rebuy and straight rebuy. New task refers to a situation where a buyer has a new need and it cannot, or very limitedly so, rely on previous information and experiences. Straight rebuy refers to a situation where a buyer buys something that is already very familiar with it. And modified rebuy is a mixture of the two other extreme situations. Think, for instance, of an organization that needs to buy a familiar item but now from a different supply market, for instance, because it opens a production location elsewhere and it needs to use local suppliers for political or trade tariff reasons. One can imagine that the supply selection process is different for these three types of situations, as we will argue in more detail later on in this e-lecture. Within the overall process of tendering and supplier selection, we can make a distinction between the qualification stage and the selection stage. This two-stage process is mainly meant to reduce the workload, both for the buying organization and the suppliers. Suppliers that are not suitable, for instance because they do not have the necessary quality management processes in place, are excluded before the final bidding process. This two-stage process is by no means universal. Sometimes buying organizations go straight into the final selection. For instance, when only a few suppliers are expected to or invited to participate in the tender process. As you can see in the slide, the Boer and colleagues argue that there are two steps before qualification and final selection problem formulation and formulation of criteria. This amounts to identifying the situation, objectives and criteria, as we discussed in the previous slide. The Boer and colleagues also indicate that in the first two steps, qualitative decision-making tools are most appropriate, while in the phases of qualification and final selection, quantitative tools can be used. We will discuss these tools in more detail in part two of our e-lecture on supplier selection. When thinking about supplier selection criteria, it may be helpful to distinguish three main levels of criteria. 
even though in publications such as Bijl and de Boer et al, these three levels are not explicitly distinguished. First, at the most aggregate level, we have the criteria or features of the supplier organization. This could include its financial stability or location, for instance. Second, we have the product or service involved, including its performance and sustainability, for instance. Thirdly, we can distinguish the conditions, including price and delivery. You will recognize these different levels of supplier product and conditions, for instance, when Bayle refers to studies that have identified price, quality and delivery as the most important selection criteria, which are in fact product or condition level criteria. Bayle also refers to production capacity, flexibility, information and communication systems. These are all supplier level criteria. While the product and condition level are perhaps not always clearly separated, distinguishing supplier level versus product level characteristics is relevant. It is relevant because the ambiguity or uncertainty regarding these characteristics may differ. Scores for supplier performance dimensions are perhaps less precise and information is, particularly for new suppliers, more difficult to gather. In some situations, the information on one of the three levels is simply not there. Think of selecting a supplier that will become involved in collaborative product development. There is no product yet to select on. Most importantly, perhaps, is that in the qualification process, as described earlier, buyers typically look at supplier features and only in the final selection will look at product features and conditions. At the start of this e-lecture, I have defined tendering as the process by which a buying organization puts up its needs for bidding by suppliers. And in slide 5, we have argued that the choice for a specific tendering procedure depends on the purchasing situation and the objectives. But what main alternative procedures does one have regarding tendering? There is no universally accepted classification of different tendering procedures, but Van Wele distinguishes four varieties which capture most of the variety in practice. Please note that we are not referring to former, formal tendering procedures under public procurement legislation, such as in the European Union. Most of the four varieties have a specific equivalent in public procurement law. Let's review the four varieties from left to right, from low formality and time investment to high formality and time investment. Non-competitive purchase means absence of competitive procedures or formal evaluation of supplier bids. One or several suppliers are directly approached to close a contract, although some negotiations of terms may still take place. Informal negotiations, the second alternative, are somewhat more competitive, where some suppliers may not get an order in the end. Then there are two main varieties of what are called tendering procedures in the more narrow sense. Closed tenders are on invitation only, whereas open tenders are open to everyone. While open tenders are mostly known from the public sector, they can and are also applied in the private sector. The choice between these four varieties depends on the purchasing situation. For instance, non-competitive tendering may be chosen when one is dealing with a very small order, when the supplier is an exclusive owner of a patent or there is already a very successful relationship in place. An open tender is typically chosen for large volume purchases and where a buying firm is not fully knowledgeable about suitable suppliers. For instance, because it is a new task buy. As part of the tendering process, various requests may be sent out to suppliers, particularly in the closed and open tender procedures as just discussed. While there is no agreed upon terminology in general, we can distinguish three different types 
of requests to suppliers. Requests for the information, request for proposal and request for quotation. Together these requests may be seen as a funnel process, but not all steps have to be executed each time. We follow Bail in describing these requests. First, a request for information or RFI is used when the buyer seeks to gain market intelligence regarding what alternatives and possibilities are available to meet the buyer needs. Some suppliers may not respond or the buyer may deem that the supplier is not very suitable, reducing the set of potential suppliers in the next phases. Second, a request for proposals or RFP is issued when this buyer has a sense of the marketplace and has a statement of work or specifications containing a set of performance requirements that the buyer needs fulfilled. Supplier proposals on how to fulfill the buyer needs could differ, for instance, in terms of the technology they want to apply. Based on the proposals, the buying firm may decide to further narrow the set of suppliers that is asked to submit an actual bid or quote. This set of suppliers are the so-called qualified or approved vendors. This was also mentioned in slide 6. In general, there is no rule that this qualification stage, as we also discussed earlier, takes place only after the suppliers have responded to the RFP. Sometimes it can already take place after the responses to the RFI. Third, a request for quote or quotations is issued when the buyer can develop a statement of work that states the exact specifications of the goods or services needed. After these requests, a buyer may enter a negotiation process with one or several suppliers, but not necessarily so. In the case of an RFQ, a clear winning supplier may have already emerged and further negotiations are not necessary. All the three steps may be used consecutively, but not necessarily so. One could start directly with an RFQ, in the case of a standard or familiar items. This would constitute a straight rebuy. Perhaps one would like to start with an RFP, in the case of non-standard or complex items, or when the buyer only has set functional specifications and is interested to learn about different technological solutions. Finally, a buyer may decide to start with an RFI when it has a completely new requirement and is not familiar with the relevant supplier market. This would constitute a new task buy situation. Finally, we go back to slide 5 and provide a framework of how the purchasing situation may affect the four different steps defined earlier. Problem definition, criteria formulation, qualification and choice. In the columns you see a classification of different purchasing situations. De Boer and colleagues classify these situations based on the new task, modified rebuy and straight rebuy classification from the marketing and organizational buying behavior literature and combine this with the different quadrants from the Kralich category sourcing portfolio. This results in four buying situations. What the Boer and colleagues are basically suggesting is that for the supplier selection process in a new task buying situation, it does not matter which quadrant from the Kralich portfolio one is dealing with. There is just one column. In the case of a new task buy, the specific challenges for supplier selections is that there is no previously used criterion and, here, and there are no historical records available, making the selection process more challenging and potentially more costly. There is a lot of uncertainty in new task buying situations. On the right hand side, you see two different straight rebuy situations. In case of a routine item, there are many suppliers that could supply the item. However, because of the low value of the items, 
it will not pay off to frequently search for and select suppliers. The choice of the supplier is fixed for a reasonable period of time. And the suitability of the supplier is typically reconsidered periodically and if necessary a new selection will take place. In the case of bottleneck and strategic items, the choice of the supplier is also more or less fixed. Small changes in the specification of the items are usually dealt with by the existing supplier. In these cases with a high supply risk there are virtually no suppliers to choose from immediately either because of a highly unique specification or because of the scarcity of the material. As a result, the choice set is often much smaller. Decision models are primarily used as a means for periodic evaluation or monitoring of the existing supplier or suppliers. Leverage items finally, the second column from the left, according to De Boer et al, typically involve modified rebuy situations. There are many suppliers to choose from, while the high value and saving or improvement potential of the items justifies proactive search and frequent selection of suppliers. So, in conclusion, we can summarize the takeaways from this e-lecture on supplier selection the process as follows. One. Four major steps in tendering and supplier selection can be defined. Problem definition, criteria formulation, qualification and choice. Second, selection criteria can be applied at the level of the supplier and the level of the product service and its conditions. And qualification usually takes place using supplier related criteria. And thirdly, the criteria applied and the process adopted for supplier selection and tendering vary. They vary by the objectives for the purchase item or sourcing category, and they vary by the purchasing situation, as for instance classified in terms of new task, modified rebuy and straight rebuy, or classified in terms of the purchasing portfolio such as proposed by Kralic, routine items, leverage items, etc. This concludes our e-lecture on supplier selection part one. On this slide you will see the references that I've used during this e-lecture.